Just letting folks join up and then we'll get started in a minute here. All right, I'll go ahead and get started. Okay, can everyone see my uh, presentation here? We're seeing your presenter view. My presenter view, oh no. Swap displays, does that help? Yes. yes. All right, good. Okay, well, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for the spring 2023 uh, University of Miami's Rosenstiel School of Marine Atmospheric and Earth Science Virtual Open House. We're going to keep things moving pretty quickly today, hopefully. We'll have um, mostly little bite-sized five-minute chunks. If you're interested in looking at the schedule, you can look back at the registration page where we have um, a list of uh, kind of topics and times. Uh, my name is Dr. Andrew Janice Elmore. I'm the Assistant Dean of Engagement at the Rosensteel School, and I deal a lot with recruiting and outreach. So if you're um, interested in joining as a student or working with us in some other capacity, please feel free to reach out. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, let me just run through a few quick little facts about our school before we get started on learning more about our different departments and centers. So the Rosensteel School was founded in the 1940s, and it started off as a marine station for the University of Miami. And then over time, it grew to include atmospheric sciences as well as marine geosciences and other earth sciences. Uh, and at this point, we're pretty much uh, encompassing everything in marine related science. Uh, our degrees, we have undergraduate degrees and quite a robust undergraduate program, which you'll hear more about later. We also have two kinds of master's degrees, uh, a master of science where uh, you do a traditional research thesis and a master of professional science, which is geared more toward a kind of practical uh, internship component, uh, although it can also include a lot of research. And finally, we include a pretty sweet package of PhD uh, assistantships as well, which have five years of guaranteed funding, including stipend and uh, living expenses and health insurance. All right. So our undergraduate majors, you'll hear a little more about later, but I just briefly wanted to touch on the fact that we have this many, geological sciences, marine affairs, marine biology and ecology, marine science, we have a dual major program, and uh, meteorology and oceanography. And one of the cool components of our undergraduate uh, program is that we also allow students to get a fair amount of meaningful hands-on research experience early in their career. Um, and I think this is a pretty cool and unique program. Um, basically, you can circulate through different labs and kind of get a lot of hands-on experience working in a lab uh, on our marine campus. So hopefully you'll hear a little more about that later. We also have a study abroad for undergraduates, uh, Galapagos, which takes students to the Galapagos Islands for a field-oriented uh, semester of study. Uh, they live in with and kind of homestays with in a local village and take courses that are um, kind of geared toward marine science and biology. For our PhD and Master of Science programs, um, we have multiple programs here, again, quite a few, but the main ones I would say are probably atmospheric science, marine biology and ecology, environmental science and policy, and marine geosciences and ocean sciences. We also have kind of joint programs in data science, climate and health, and meteorology and physical oceanography, as well as ocean engineering. Um, the last thing I quickly wanted to talk about um, is that we have a master professional science program, which you're going to also hear a little bit more about later, but I also just wanted to quickly cover it. Uh, this is one of our kind of special programs in that it's a very innovative degree, and it's intended for students who are looking for more um, kind of hands-on training in a career-oriented uh, degree in 
marine atmospheric or earth science. So in this kind of program, there's not that much difference as far as coursework is concerned. For both a Master of Science and a Master of Professional Science, you do nine months of coursework in your first year. But whereas in the Master of Science program, you might do a year or occasionally two years of a research thesis in the following um, uh, two years after your first, with a Master of Professional Science, you wind up doing a three to nine months on average internship. Um, and I'd say the majority of students probably complete their degree within 15 months. And that's simply because after they complete their coursework, they start an internship at any number of organizations, National Park Service, NOAA, um, or private sector companies or nonprofits. Uh, and that also can include research labs on our own campus or on other campuses. So for some students, this can mean that they do wind up producing um, research papers and things like that. For others, it can mean that they have a very clear path to achieving a credential that will help them get the job they want. So our MPS is organized a little differently, even though all of the tracks are technically within departments. There are uh, 14 tracks, and the reason we have tracks is because they're very much oriented, again, toward kind of career-based outcomes and skills. So you can see we have quite a few here. This is only some of them. Applied remote sensing, aquaculture, broadcast meteorology, climate and society, coastal zone management, exploration science, fisheries management. We also have a combined uh, uh, JD and MPS program for people who are interested in kind of law and policy. Marine conservation, one of our most flexible tracks, and uh, marine mammal science, uh, natural hazards and catastrophes, tropical marine ecosystem management, underwater archaeology, and weather forecasting. So you can see we have 14 tracks. It's quite uh, a stack of stuff. So one thing I quickly wanted to mention is that when you apply to our school as a graduate student, you are allowed to mark on your application multiple options. And we do in fact encourage you to do this because it gives us more flexibility with kind of putting your application in the right place at the right time. So for the MPS in particular, you're allowed to select up to two tracks by rank choice, but you can also mark that you wanna be considered for MPS or MS in addition to the PhD program. So if you're interested in learning more, feel free to reach out. Uh, for the MPS, I should mention that applications are actually still open. Uh, our PhD and MS applications end in January. However, for MPS, we have kind of a separate admissions system for it. And so it's able to keep on going through usually June 1st um, or May 1st for international students. So uh, the key thing I think is that program requirements vary by track. I've got them listed here. Um, you can see that for some of them, they can be uh, a little more specific about which biology or chemistry or calculus labs they might want. For others, they may only require a bachelor, a bachelor's degree in any field. So there's quite a spectrum of different uh, backgrounds that you can have to come and do this kind of master's degree with us. Um, this is just kind of a little showcase of some of the master's students who we've had in the past who are now um, doing various kinds of activities, textile recycling, biology, environmental protection agency work. The other final thing I just quickly wanted to mention before passing this on is that um, we do offer tours of campus. You just have to book them a day in advance if you're physically here. So you can sign up on our Calendly on our website. Uh, you can also uh, sign up for a virtual information session. So if you're thinking about um, graduate school and you're not quite sure what the experience will be like, mm -hmm. we have a number of former and current graduate students who are very happy to chat with you. I'm also happy to chat with you. So have a look at our virtual information sessions if you want to learn more. Again, uh, the application deadline for MPS right now, since that's our only program that's open, is June 1st for domestic, May 1st for international. And you usually hear back on your application decision within four to six weeks. And the GRE for all of our graduate applications is not required. Uh, so if you want to apply, just go to our website, uh, earth.miami.edu, and you can see in the corner, there's a little orange box. Um, financing your education, there's a few opportunities uh, for MPS and for PhD. MS degree tends to be self-funded. And if you'd like to follow the, us on any of our social media platforms, I'll just leave this up for a moment. Um, and we'll also put it up later in the um, in our slides toward the end of the event as well. So thank you very much. If you would like to learn any more from me, feel free to reach out. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and start introducing our departments. So our first department today 
will be MPS because MPS is open. So I just wanted to make sure you all have a chance to learn what you want to about it. Um, Chelsea, would you like to take over? Chelsea and Kayla, they're both the senior program coordinators for uh, our MPS program. Thanks, Andrew. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Right. How does that look to everybody? Perfect. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us at today's open house. My name is Kayla McEntee. And I'm Chelsea Bagnow. And we are the senior program coordinators of the MPS program. Chelsea and I are also both alumni of the program themselves. And we are really excited to talk to you today more about this specific graduate program. Um, and before we really get started, you'll notice that we have a lot of pictures on this screen. Um, and I really wanna point out that all of these pictures are of our actual MPS students doing some of their real science work. Um, and these pictures were taken during field courses, travel courses, the internship experience. And you'll also notice some pictures of our campus sprinkled in as well. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a better idea of what it looks like uh, when you contribute or participate in the MPS program. So the MPS degree is an accelerated professional science program and it equips students with the knowledge, the training and the real world experience to prepare for careers in today's professional science job market. Our students can actually complete their degree in as little as uh, 12 months, excuse me, and go on to work on in various sectors like uh, Dr. Elmore mentioned in sectors like industry, government and nonprofit organizations. So also like Andrew mentioned, we offer 14 unique tracks to choose from. Some are as specialized as underwater archeology span and broadcast meteorology and others are as broad as marine conservation and climate and society. Um, our students usually take two semesters of coursework and then transition to their internship. And during their internship, they can apply all that they've learned in their classes to an independent research project. This is done at a host organization of their choosing. So this program offers a lot of flexibility when selecting an internship opportunity and allows students to choose the location and duration of their internship and explore new interests within the realm of science. Personally, uh, as a graduate of this program, one of the things that I appreciated the most was the variety of course offerings that were available to students. Uh, when I was in the program, this really allowed me to explore my interests and discover topics in science that I didn't know about previously. Some of the classes that I really enjoyed and gained a unique skill set from were uh, citizen science, marine conservation outreach, and the professional writing and science communication course. Another thing that I really appreciate about the Rosenstiel School is the welcoming and fun atmosphere here, as well as the vast network of connections that our community has. Absolutely. And I'm going to take this moment to acknowledge that if you haven't already seen the little Easter eggs of Chelsea and I in these pictures, I would love to draw your attention to one at the bottom of the screen now, which is Chelsea on the Galapagos trip that we went on together. So from my own experience, also as an MPS student, I really appreciated that this program um, was open to students of all backgrounds, like Andrew already mentioned. So my undergraduate degrees were in public health and psychology, but I was able to come into the marine conservation track here. And my background that was not purely a science background was actually great for contributing to different classroom discussions and bringing different perspectives from not only myself, but also everybody with different backgrounds. Um, had a lot to say and I learned a lot from my peers along with um, the faculty and staff that were on campus. Um, I also really appreciated that the program was so flexible. So all of the students that were coming in with different backgrounds and interests were able to take courses that were tailored to their interests and find internships that were uh, unique to their own career and um, professional goals. Thank you so much, Kayla and Chelsea. Um, and just so you all know, Kayla and Chelsea will also be available for various kinds of virtual info sessions if you have any questions. And we'll be leading um, some of the, uh, if you've already been admitted, for example, you'll be talking to them a lot more in the coming months as well. Thank you so much. I'd like to now introduce um, Dr. Jeffrey Suprem, who is an associate professor in our Department of Environmental science and policy, and is going to talk a little bit about his research in the department. Cheers, Andrew. Um, are my slides working okay? Yes. Cool. Uh, so hi, everyone. Um, as Andrew said, my name is Jeffrey Supran. I'm a professor here in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at Rosenstiel. Um, and I'm actually 
in thinking about how to talk to you about the department, it occurred to me I'm actually kind of in a similar boat to you because I'm learning about the school too, because I'm brand new here too. Um, I just started in January. And so I thought maybe the best way to talk to you about why you should consider joining our environmental science and policy department is actually by first explain, explaining why I decided to. Um, so like many of you, I was originally trained in the physical sciences. I've always believed in the power of science to make the world a better place. And, you know, that belief took me first to study physics as an undergraduate and then to do renewable energy engineering uh, for my PhD. But about halfway through my PhD, I was inventing next generation solar cells and LEDs using nanotechnology. I came to a bit of a startling realization, which was that we actually already have the science and technology we need to start tackling the climate change crisis. And what we lack is the social and political will to do so. Science obviously remains vital and a, a deep passion of mine and everyone here, but at, at this crucial historical juncture, climate change and many other environmental challenges are no longer fundamentally technical problems, but also political ones. And obviously this was a pretty startling realization for me because I suddenly started to feel like I was doing the wrong PhD. You know, I was no longer working at the bottleneck to this problem, which is I think where most scientists want to be. And so to make a long story short, I began to retrain first into science and technology policy and then into history of science. And I began to apply my quantitative background to one particular piece of that political bottleneck, which is the stranglehold that oil and gas companies have on science-based decision-making and frankly, American democracy. And in particular, my research investigates climate denial and propaganda by fossil fuel interests. Um, for instance, a major thrust of my research right now is using um, big data machine learning techniques to analyze climate change misinformation on social media. So I decided to make the environmental science and policy department my academic home because it is the hub at Rosenstiel for connecting the natural sciences with society and policy. Our department is built on a realization, just like the realization I had during grad school, that better scientific information alone, without the full context of culture and socioeconomics and politics and psychology and so on, is never going to fully get the job done. And I suspect that many of you, like me and my colleagues, are passionate about, about both doing cutting edge scientific research, but also getting the job done about having a real world impact with our work. And so if so, I'd like to encourage you to consider um, both Rosenstiel as a whole and our department in particular, because you know whether it's climate change, overfishing, habitat degradation, water and land use mismanagement, pollution, natural hazards, whatever it may be, we cannot solve the world's most pressing environmental crises without first recognizing that people and the environment are two inherently linked components of the earth system. And that is what our department is all about. Problem-oriented, solutions-driven, interdisciplinary environmental social science research that draws together disciplines and joins the dots between science and society. So our research and teaching span everything from you know, climate change disinformation that I teach to the cultural anthropology of offshore shipwrecks, from communication science to fishery science, from climate adaptation to resource and environmental economics, always with a continuous commitment to producing world-class scholarship that is also actionable and policy relevant. And I'm really proud to say that, for example, my work is helping to inform congressional investigations, lawsuits, grassroots advocacy, and has been covered by thousands of news outlet outlets worldwide. And, you know, for instance, just the other day, one of my colleagues was telling me about how she was just at the Pentagon briefing them, you know, classified information about her research on coastal adaptation. And these are just a couple of examples of how both our research and all of our de degree programs are aimed at cultivating a new generation of interdisciplinary scholars to operate at that impactful interface of science and policy. Thank so you. In a nutshell, um, I was just going to finish by saying whether you, you see yeah. yourself becoming a professor or going into government or working in the private or nonprofit sectors, um, I'd really encourage you to think about where the bottlenecks to our environmental crises truly lie and to consider joining our department to work on them. Thanks. Sorry for running. No, thank you so much, Dr. Supran. Uh, I'd love to introduce now for our marine biology and ecology department, uh, Dr. Richard Coleman, who is one of our new professors as well. Hey, everybody. Sorry, let me get this. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. 
Yeah, um, yeah. I just want to take the time to thank everybody for joining us. Yeah, I'm Richard Coleman. I'm an physicist and a professor in the Marine Biology and Ecology Department. I'll just be giving a quick overview of what our department um, offers. And so I wanted to first go over um, some of the research themes that I think really encapsulates the, the type of research and the expertise that's available through our department. So it's just starting off um there's a, a lot of research looking at benthic ecology and so in this sort of research field we we're trying to we're trying to understand the dynamics of benthic habitats and this could be coral systems or even seagrass and we're trying to we're trying to understand the impacts to um, of natural disturbances and um, predicted changes to due to, to climate change um, we also have a lot of research looking at cnidarian um, immunity and so in this type of research, we're trying to investigate um, disease processes, environmental stressors, and the cellular uh, mechanisms of immunity, particularly within cnidarians. And then looking at coral reef futures, um, the researchers that are sort of involved in this aspect of, of, of the, um, in, this, in this theme, want to understand the relationship between corals and their algal symbionts, so symbiodinium and particularly they're interested in uh, trying to understand how they'll uh, the coral and the algal symbiont will adapt to future climate change there's also a lot of research looking at environmental physiology and toxicology and so the researchers that are involved in that type of research um, examine how aquatic animals cope with natural and man-made environmental stressors um, at the physiological level um, my personal expertise is fish ecology and evolution, um, and so the what I'm interested in is looking at coral reef fishes in particular and understanding the mechanisms that influence the distribution of species. If you're a close circuit rebreather diver, um, I'm actually trained as one. I'm able to dive down to 400 feet, and so I'm really interested in looking at assemblages between shallow and deep in environments. There's a lot of research in our department looking at marine genomics. So scientists in this pathway want to understand the roles of genes, gene expression, and genetic adaptation in the marine environment. Um, we have a um, one of our new faculty is a microbial ecologist, so microbial ecology and evolution. So trying to understand um, the ecology and evolution of marine viruses in particular, but also phytoplankton. There's a lot of research looking at ocean acidification. And so studies that are or research in, in this area aim to understand how corals will grow and survive um, with increased warming. Um, that's also coupled with the effects of ocean acidification. And so looking at pro projections of climate change, you know, what will happen there. Um, our rescue a reef um, program uh, uses science um, based techniques to grow threatened coral species. Um, on land and then outplanting them into offshore nurseries. And it's also a really large community science um, component that's involved in the outplanting itself. And then finally, um, we have a really large area of, of toadfish research. And this is just a mixture of whole animal physiology, molecular biology, pharmacology, behavior, toxicology, all related to, to the Gulf toadfish. Um, I also wanted to go over this is um, four main research research centers. So we have the Broad Key Marine Station. This is located off the coast of Key Largo, and this houses up to 20 people. And you could use this facility for long-term research projects or you know, as a central point for, for research. We also have the experimental fish hatchery. And in this facility, we culture a variety of organisms, including cobia, mai mahi, snappers. Um, but the hatchery and this facility is really interested in understanding the, the signals for spawning and how that could be used and be informed for aquaculture. I'm so we sorry to stop you there, Richard, um, yeah. because we're at time. But um, if you want, you could also um, stick around for the Q&A. There are usually a whole lot for um, marine biology, so that could be a great time to also follow up with the others. Thank sure, you sure. so much. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, not at all. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce for uh, the Department of Marine Geosciences, uh, Professor Jim Klaus, who is also the program director for our undergraduate program in geological sciences. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Um, can everyone see the 
The screen, okay. Perfect. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you about the Department of Marine Geosciences and, and geologists study the earth and, and earth processes. Um, and that ranges from what happens at the surface to what happens deeper in the, in the mantle and the core. And we utilize this, this knowledge and understanding of the earth to, to understand the deep history of our planet and how it's changed over time, but also natural resources, where they come from and how we um, utilize those resources and also how we live on this planet and mitigate the, the effects of, of both natural and, and anthropogenic hazards like, like climate change and sea level rise and earthquakes and, and all sorts of other activities that occur on, on our planet. Okay, so uh, our department uh, houses about 17 faculty and lecturers that, that teach within our our program and do research within our program. Um, we have a wide background of disciplines, but we, we tend to focus on four general areas and that's sort of sedimentology. Um, and we have a lot of faculty doing research on, you know, tropical marine sediments and environments and coral reef uh, environments, uh, faculty studying oceanography. And then we have focal areas in, in both geophysics and, and geochemistry. So our students and faculty, uh, you know, we cover a lot of ground, but we tend to focus in these particular areas, um, and that uh, serves to generate a lot of nice collaborations uh, amongst our various specialties and, and disciplines. Um, so we oversee both undergraduate and, and graduate programs in, in marine geosciences. As Andrew mentioned, we have uh, uh, undergraduate BS and BA programs in geological sciences, a double major in marine science and geological sciences where uh, students can combine their interests in marine science and geological sciences. Um, we have a five-year um, undergraduate graduate degree where students can, um, can obtain both their BS in, in geology and their master of science degree in, uh, in five years or slightly shortened uh, time period. Uh, and then we oversee the three graduate degrees in, in marine geosciences, as Andrew said, the PhD and uh, the master's degrees. And then we're excited to, to sort of announce that we'll be starting the, our, a new MPS program in environmental geology uh, this coming fall. So we're, um, we've developed new curricula and, and we're in the process and, and welcome to accept new applications and, and new students. Um, so our programs uh, across the board focus on mentoring, um, strong mentor relationships between faculty and students. Uh, most of our uh, under our graduate research programs are funded through, you know, NASA, NSF, and our graduates go on to seek careers in, in a range of employment opportunities in academia, government, nonprofits, and industry. Um, I think I can skip this. Um, so regardless of whether you come in for a PhD, a master's or an undergraduate program, all of our students um, get to utilize um, extensive resources in, in our laboratories, ranging from high tech uh, isotope laboratory facilities, geophysical um, laboratory facilities, seismic uh, interpretation and seismology facilities, um, that again are all open and available to our graduate and undergraduate students. And uh, with that, I'll just leave you with this slide. This is from an article published a, a few years back in, the, in Forbes magazine where they reported that geology students were the happiest on uh, college campuses. And, um, you know, I'd like to think our students are some of the happiest, but I look around at the other programs and their students are, are certainly happy. But <clears throat> I think the ability to sort of explore your curiosity of the earth and the oceans, um, solve challenging problems and, and um, make a career out of it is, is very rewarding. And I encourage you all to sort of look into it and, and look forward to seeing you here in the future. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass to uh, Professor Hillary Close from our Ocean Sciences Department. All right, can you hear me and see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. 
Um, I'm Dr. Hilary Close. I'm a marine organic uh, and isotope geochemist in the Department of Ocean Sciences. Um, I want to give you just a brief overview of the types of things that we do here and the programs that we have. Um, let me just change this so I can actually see my slides. So a brief overview, there's about 20 to 24 faculty members in OCE, and everybody does some form of research, and most of those people are also involved in teaching. We do everything ocean. There's a lot of physics going on in different ways, so both including making measurements of physics in the ocean as well as modeling of physics in the ocean, uh, remote optical sensing using satellites, and then there's those of us like me who are chemists or biogeochemists. And how we actually do our work is some combination of actual seagoing oceanography, going out on big oceanographic vessels into the middle of the ocean, collecting samples or otherwise taking data. We also have a range of chemistry and physics labs um, across the campus. And then there are those people, all of us are involved in some sort of form of data analysis, but we have specialists in kind of cutting edge data analysis. Um, and kind of applied math approaches. So um, the, the participation in the research can take on a number of forms from like getting dirty in the field to spending all of your time cranking through data at a computer. Um, our graduate programs, we are active in PhD and master's degrees, and there's a number of tracks that I, these are available on the website, so I'm not gonna go over in too much detail. In MPS, we have a remote sensing track and a natural hazards track. Uh, on the undergraduate side, we uh, currently administer the marine science double major program, and we have a single major in oceanography. And uh, those of us in the OCE uh, department, we teach a lot of the marine science courses, we teach in the Galapagos program, and we host a lot of undergraduate research. And just one thing I wanna mention is that that active research done by our graduate students and our undergraduate students can lead to publications. It can lead to uh, going to conferences as an example of a student of mine presenting at a big conference. Um, so that's, that's common across all of our programs, but I just wanted to point that out. And then I also wanted to point out that there's a lot of exchange between all of these components, the faculty, the graduate students, and the undergraduate students. In my lab, for instance, I have a few undergraduate students working with my graduate students in the lab together. The graduate students love it because they get some help with their projects. The undergraduates are getting a hands-on experience in the lab, also going out into the field. So my graduate students go out on ships. We're getting, getting some undergraduates out on ships too. Um, so like I said, a lot of the departmental info is available on the website, so definitely go there. Um, this is me, H. Close at Miami, and I do have a lab website. Several of our faculty also have lab websites, so just click around to get a better idea of any of this. Um, just really quickly, a little bit more about who we are, because it takes a lot of forms in how the many different ways you can study the ocean. So a lot of us are seagoing oceanographers. Here are some examples of action shots. So Dr. Lisa Beal was just out on a big campaign off of South Africa. These are big research vessels that are out for a month at a time in the middle of the ocean. You basically live on the ship. We do a lot of that in my lab too. This is us off of Bermuda. We tend to stay in the tropics where it's warm, whereas this is the Hansel lab up here uh, in the Arctic. Uh, the CARTH program, which was active in tracing oil from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, we also are the sort of leading force of the undergraduate cruises on the, sh the, the, the ship of the Rosen Steel School, the Walton Smith. And we actually get students out to just learn oceanographic techniques, but also it's an opportunity to collect samples for their own research projects. These are from some current students in one of my upper class labs, collecting samples that we then analyze as Part of our class. And I also just wanted to mention that the graduate students also have the opportunity to volunteer on those cruises, both to just get out on the ship and also get a little bit of teaching experience. And um, I'm so sorry, I'm going to have to stop you there, Dr. Yeah, so <laughs> I'll just, through these last two, we have a lot of labs doing chemistry and physics. And then we also, like I said, have a lot of people whose products end up looking a lot more like data analysis um, uh, types of products. So like I said, a lot of this you can find by clicking around through people's websites, but I'm happy to answer questions too. Thank you. Now I will go ahead and pass to another professor in ocean sciences, uh, Dr. Vaith Shurayef, 
who is also the director of our Aircraft Center for Earth Studies. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Vaid, and I'm coming to Rosenstiel for a year and a half ago from NASA, where I directed uh, a lab inventing new technologies. I now direct the Aircraft Center for Earth Studies here with a focus on trying to understand our home world. We have mapped more of the surface of Mars, the sun, and the moon than we have of our own ocean floor. So I'm a bit of a recovering astrophysicist moved into oceanography. We also are not the only ocean in the solar system. We now know of at least four uh, uh, oceans outside gas giants of our, of our solar system, including Triton, uh, Titan, and Enceladus in Europa. And at ACES, I, I lead a team that's developing new instrumentation, mostly for NASA, National Geographic, and NOAA, to investigate our home planets, oceans, as well as these other ocean worlds. There's five, or sorry, four main components of ACES. One is a sensor development program, where we actually are building sensors with students. An aeronautics program, where we develop these instruments further on airborne platforms, uh, high-altitude drones, boats. Uh, a, a path to space on CubeSat satellites. These are very small form factor satellites that we use with NASA, and also a high performance and AI computing component that processes data sets from these instruments. So just to give you an idea of what I typically do, um, I will lead airborne field missions across the world. This is from American Samoa, and my instrument gathers data from above the ocean surface on aircraft. We also have in-water components. And one of the main technologies, fluid cam and fluid lensing, is designed to reveal uh, that seafloor at the centimeter scale in 3D. So we've been essentially mapping the ocean bit by bit using this technology, and it's advancing uh, quite quickly. So we have now fleets of aircraft across the Pacific that are continuing this work. NASA NemoNet is a game where you classify the world's coral reefs by painting on real-life images scanned from the ocean floor using a revolutionary instrument that lets us see beneath the waves at unprecedented resolutions. Our oceans are so vast, it would take us two million years to classify the world's coral reefs by hand. The classifications you create are sent to our teams of NASA scientists at home base to teach our supercomputer to classify coral reefs on a global scale. So in addition to developing those technologies, we develop platforms. This is uh, one of the solar boats I built with my very talented MPS student, Stephanie Wright, who recently graduated. And we're always looking for new MPS and PhD students to join the team. The coming uh, next month is a flying research vessel to further augment the program, and this vessel has already been designed with instruments to look at marine plastics in the sea, as well as launch and recover our aircraft for local mapping missions in the Florida Keys. We have a state-of-the-art uh, helicopter observation platform that we use to test instruments that are even heavier. And then going to higher altitudes with NASA, we've been developing high-altitude uh, solar drones that fly for three months at a time, also carrying these instruments to map the seafloor. So if you're interested in any of these technologies or getting involved on the engineering side, on the field campaign side, at the data processing side, there's a lot of opportunities in my lab for students. And I encourage you to visit our website and learn more. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Turayev. Um, all right. Our final uh, presenter for our section on departments and programs is uh, for our atmospheric sciences department, Dr. Lisa Murphy goes, who's also the program director for our undergraduate atmospheric sciences program. I don't think I can hear you if you're um, talking, Dr. Thank you. Sorry about that. I turned on the video, but forgot to unmute. Okay, so my email address is here in case you have questions um, after my talk. I'm also happy to answer in the chat. Um, so I am the program director for the undergraduate uh, meteorology program. We have the single major, which comes with a minor in math, but also uh, several uh, double major tracks, including uh, those, those with applied math, marine science, and broadcast journalism. Our students are involved in our student club, which is the American Meteorological Society, where we bring in uh, guest speakers who talk about different uh, career paths in the field of atmospheric science. They also go on local field trips to news stations, our National Weather Service, National Hurricane Center, um, and they travel to the annual meeting, which takes place in uh, various cities around the country every January. So we get uh, partial funding for them to travel to the conference where they can present their own um, independent research. We have lots of undergraduates working on research. Um, this was them presenting last year at our research symposium. 
They've, wo they've won uh, research awards for outstanding student poster presentation. Um, we've also been highly successful in getting um, a lot of internships and scholarships for our undergrads. We've had eight NOAA Hauling Scholarships recipients over the past uh, few years. Uh, they receive um, academic tuition support as well as an internship uh, during the summer prior to their senior year to work with a NOAA, NOAA mentor. Uh, they've worked on uh, senior theses with lots of faculty here um, at the Rosensteel School who are experts in the fields of hurricane science, climate change and variability, um, and cloud physics and radiation. We also have our MPS program, which has several tracks, uh, broadcast meteorology, weather forecasting, and climate and society. This is essentially an accelerated master's program, so students can um, get their advanced degree in as little as uh, just over 12 months. They take uh, many of the same courses as our uh, PhD students, uh, but they are also, instead of writing a dissertation, they work um, on an internship. Um, and I listed several locations. So we've had students work with hurricane scientists at the Hurricane Research Division, um, looking to better you know, understand how uh, hurricanes undergo rapid intensification. They're using the data um, that they collect, those scientists collect out there, um, as well as the National Weather Service, news stations. We have students who are in the field of broadcasts, so they get that um, real world on the job experience. Um, our graduate program is fully funded, so students receive an annual salary as well as um, tuition support and health insurance. Uh, they work with faculty, again, who are experts in hurricane science, so looking at, you know, rapid intensification. Some of them have traveled. Some of our graduate students have gotten to travel and uh, work with hurricane scientists flying in um, to hurricanes to gather more data. So we call them hurricane hunters. Um, and then they use that data to help better their models. So we need better models to make better forecasts. Uh, we also have faculty who are experts in climate change and climate variability. If we wanna know what's gonna happen in the future, we need to know, better understand those um, internal drivers of climate change and how to separate them from um, anthropogenic or man-made drivers. Uh, we also have faculty who are looking at sub-seasonal to seasonal predictions. So things like ENSO, um, in the Madden Julian oscillation. Um, on the bottom right, we see we've just recently transitioned from a La Nina cool event in the tropical Pacific to an El Nino event. Uh, right there's the Galapagos Islands, which a lot of our undergrads go there for study abroad, especially those who double major with marine science. And um, you might be wondering why I'm showing a kitchen sink, <laughs> but if you look straight ahead, you can see the Atlantic Ocean. Um, that's a field site that one of our faculty, Dr. Gaston, runs. A lot of her graduate students get to go there to collect data. They're looking at um, aerosols that get um, lofted into the atmosphere and swept across the ocean and deposit um, both over the ocean and the Amazon rainforest. So looking at how um, those aerosols can impact ecosystems as well as air quality. Um, our grad students are also involved in mentorship programs. So we have the GUM graduate undergraduate mentorship. This is uh, graduate students in all departments. Uh, they get experience, especially if they wanna go on to academia. Um, mentoring an undergraduate student who might have the same aspirations. Um, and Canes on Cades, if you're going to be here a little bit later, we have a student um, who will also talk about that um, hurricane outreach group where they go um, around Florida and make public, um, give public presentations. So they learn how to communicate their science to people who don't have um, science backgrounds, which is very important for our field. So I'll leave it Wonderful. at that. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Murphy goes. Um, that is a lovely photo. Uh, so we reached our Q and A time, and I just wanted to let uh, the folks who are attending the webinar know that um, you can go ahead using the Q and A uh, tab at the bottom of the screen. Uh, just open that, and you can type in your questions. And some of those we'll be able to have um, our presenters just answer. Uh, by typing in the answer in the Q&A, and others we can just select so that they can be answered live. So we'll just give you a moment to go ahead and type in any questions you might have. Um,
In the meantime, I have one kind of general question, which is um, what sort of students do you think are a good fit for the Rosenstiel School? That's a very open question, but maybe we could get one or two answers on that. Jim, did you have an answer? Um, well, sure, I can take a stab at that. Well, I mean, I think students that that love the environment, love the earth, and and certainly love to be outside and appreciate our our oceans and our planet and and the things that live on it certainly come into this program in a very engaged way. That you know they feel passionate about what they're studying and the problems that they're they're trying to solve. So I think you know at the at the core of it, a, a love of the earth and and understanding our earth is 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 a big part of it. Um, beyond that, I think you know liking to solve problems and and as um, as Jeffrey said, you know a, a desire to want to make an impact on on our planet and and our time here. Those are the things that 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 I see as being you know really the key to success when students come here. It's really that will to to want to learn and to want to, to make an impact while they're here. Yes. Great. Thank curiosity. you. Curiosity. Please. Curiosity. That's all. <laughs> Just be curious and be hardworking and you will, you will find like-minded peers. Wonderful. Um, we have another question. Can we give some examples of where MPS students do their internships? Uh, I could Trayeth has an answer on that. <laughs> yeah, um, I took my MPS student to Lanai in ho near Hawaii, as well as Guam and other Pacific islands to do a, um, a full scale mapping campaign. That may not be the typical MPS internship experience, but um, it is for my group. I would not say it is atypical, um, but there's a large other variety. Does anyone else have an example? Um, just generally speaking, a lot of our MPS students do internships with NOAA. So there's a NOAA facility that's right next to the um, Rosenstiel School. And a lot of them get connected with researchers there. And it really fosters really great relationships um, that continues after they graduate. Thank you. And that is actually the first time we have mentioned that NOAA has two centers right across the street from us. And that proximity is a super great resource for students here. Um, not just for MPS, but also just for general research. Um, thank you. Uh, we have another question uh, on whether people can major as an undergraduate in both environmental science related uh, majors and also something like communications and arts at the same time. Um, have you all had any students who have done something like that? Yeah, there, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of how you can can major in different undergraduate programs. And this is something that really changed a few years back with the with one of the provosts who said, you know, the best students that come into the university, you know, they may want to study marine science and and flute or music. And if we want to attract those those best students to the university, we need to make those those options available to them. And so there was a, a real push to sort of break down some of the traditional barriers that would prevent students from sort of may majoring in sort of disparate backgrounds. So I think, yeah, there are a lot of opportunities to put together what your passions are and, and major in those things as an undergraduate. Um, you can pursue a major or, you know, there's all sorts of ways that people can pursue their interests with, with minors. And we now have things called cognates where you can take your, your sort of, um, your sort of some of your introductory background classes and sort of specialized areas and their certificate programs. So there's, um, a lot of ways that you can specialize and really pursue the things that you're particularly interested in. The certificate program you just mentioned, we actually just got a question about whether the MPS program offers any certification programs, for example, GIS certification. Um, it, you know, I don't know about the MPS program in particular. I, I do know that uh, there is a, a certificate program in GIS, and I believe that's offered through the geography department, but there may be ways to sort of combine that with, um, with, the, um, with the MPS program. And, and certainly you can take classes um, that would marry those two things together. So I think there are ways of, of getting that certificate. Yes, I think you're right. Um, we also offer certifications in things 
like scientific free diving, um, scientific diving, motorboat operation, um, various other skills that people might need. Um, and then uh, what was the other one I just got? Oh, if you're interested in doing a PhD, um, what is the right way to contact professors about that? Uh, yeah, Dr. Close. Sorry, I was just also trying to type in the Q&A. Um, so uh, just email people. So if you're interested in doing a PhD, um, what's really important is that you are going to be supervised very much one-on-one -on -one by that advisor. And so as early as possible, getting in touch with somebody and letting them know of your interest. And that way they can also, you know, figure out maybe they have available funding, but if you contact them early enough, even if they don't have available funding, if, if, if it looks like you're a really promising student, they might try to work on getting funding. So really looking at thinking about what you really want to do and looking at people's recent publications and, and their websites, understanding what it is that they do, and then just contacting them. Um, and don't get discouraged. We are all very overwhelmed with email. So even if even if you don't get a response right away, don't be discouraged by that. Um, but yeah, it, it does require like starting to build a, a you know a one-on-one -on -one relationship because you're going to be working very closely in a PhD. Yeah, and I, I would just add to that that um, I've been guilty of, you know, like just missing the emails, right? So if you don't hear from us after a few days, just follow up again. Like, I, I think that um, tenacity is something that actually is quite impressive from at least my perspective. And, and that that real interest um, is, is very important. So, yeah, I'd encourage you to really pester us, like, because we, we're looking for the best students. Great. Thank you. I don't see any more open questions at this moment, but um, I did wonder, I saw one earlier about uh, the difficulty or ease of uh, having people who have joined through MPS, for example, transfer uh, into an MS or a PhD. Uh, do, you any, do any of you have any thoughts on that? I, I would say the process is going to be the same as if you were just looking to apply to a PhD or, or MS, MS program to begin with. So it would require building a relationship with a professor and figuring out if there's a funding source for you. Um, just the one detail that maybe we could add is that even though the application cycle is very uh, set, there are sometimes mid-year admits to the master's uh, MS or PhD program. So, you know, if you get to the point where, yeah, you want to transition to a more research-based uh, degree, and you know, longer degree program, just start communicating with people and um, communicating with the graduate studies office, um, and there might be options available. But um, it is the same thing. You're working one-on-one -on -one with a research supervisor, so it has to be um, a pretty close relationship. Great, thank you. And um, we have one last question I just wanted to answer, which is how many students are in each degree track for the MPS program? Um, I can't possibly list all of them because there are 14 of them, but I will tell you that our largest track is usually uh, marine conservation. And part of the appeal of that is that it has a relatively um, a more flexible kind of choose your own adventure approach. And so we have marine conservation students who do more researcher oriented work and also ones who do kind of more science communication work and may come to the degree without a background in the natural sciences, but they're just very excited about working in science. Um, so it's quite flexible. And then we have smaller tracks such as like broadcast meteorology, which has people every year who are very excited to be in it, but are not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily our largest track. So there's a wide variety of um, track sizes, um, but I'm happy to share more about that if you'd like to get in touch. Anyway, I just wanted to take a moment to thank all of our departments and programs panelists for sharing um, your expertise and for sharing your research and your thoughts on all of this. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And now we'll go ahead and move along to uh, undergraduate opportunities. 
uh, with Professor Jim Klaus again. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that you are able to share your um, slideshow, Jim. Yes. I can see it. Did you see the previous one? No, I didn't, but I still- Oh, I'm so sorry. I went through those, all those <laughs> slides and it wasn't- <laughs> No worries. I totally followed along anyway. Um, um, yeah, anyway. Um, let me just grab it. Um, and Okay. Yeah, apologies for that. So here I'm going to talk about the, the undergraduate program. This is just a shot of, of some of our um, excited and energetic undergraduates coming back from, from the field. So as uh, Andrew had mentioned previously, we have uh, six different degree options we, um, we host for the, for the undergraduate program, the Marine Science Double Major Program, Meteorology, Marine Biology and Ecology, Geological Sciences, oceanography and, and marine affairs. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we like to highlight about the, the program is, you know, while you choose a, a major, I mean, one of the, the real strengths of this program is that you really get um, a broad training in, in all of these disciplines. And whether you're a, a geological sciences major or marine affairs, you're gonna learn a lot about the ocean and, and the atmosphere and, and marine biology are in all these disciplines. And I think that's one of the, the things that, that really makes our students uh, strong when they, they move on from, from our program. Um, so one of the other things we highlight is that um, we have a lot of opportunities for our, our undergraduates to get involved in, in research. Um, so about 80% of our, our students do get in, involved in research and, and about 40% of them go on to do a, a senior thesis. Um, they present their, their, their research at, at conferences, either here at, at the university or at national conferences. And oftentimes they'll, they'll go on to, to publish their research in, in peer review papers. Um, and so uh, our students go on to all sorts of uh, things after graduation, many of them go on to graduate school in, in marine science or geological sciences. Others change course and might go to medical school, vet school, um, uh, other aspects of research or jobs in government and, and industry. Um, so our undergraduate program is, is housed on the main campus of the university, which is on the mainland in, in Coral Gables. This is the picture in the, the upper left here. Um, and so students um, are housed on that campus and you take your other undergraduate courses um, on that campus as, as well. Um, we do make an effort from, um, from the first year that students arrive to, to get students integrated with the Marine campus. So all of the, the freshman Marine science labs are, are taught out at the, at the Marine school. There's a shuttle that transports students back and forth from the main campus um, to the Marine campus. Um, we also heard about the, the flotsam cruises. So the freshman class are, are also invited to go out on the Walton Smith research vessel um, seen here and, uh, and participate in a, in a day long cruise out into the Gulf Stream where they collect um, scientific oceanographic data and, and get involved with um, working up that data and analyzing the, the data. Um, I'll go through these quick. I think we've heard about the various programs. You know, for a long time, um, we only had a single degree program, the Marine Science Double Major. Um, and so students would, would get a degree in, in Marine Science and they'd have to combine this with, with a major in another program, whether it was biology, chemistry, geological sciences. Uh, three or four years back, we expanded that and we began offering single degree programs in, in oceanography, marine biology and ecology, um, meteorology, and uh, geological sciences, and a marine affairs. Um, these programs uh, vary significantly um, and allow students to really um, sort of pursue various aspects of, of marine science. Um, one thing I will mention is that students often come in with a, a very um, 
particular interest in a program, maybe it's marine biology and ecology. But over the first year or two, there's a lot of opportunities for students to, to sort of get exposed to, to various other aspects of marine science. And oftentimes um, students will change their track and, and pursue other interests. And you know, if I had to, to say you know, one thing, one of the most important things about your undergraduate time is to really explore things and figure out where your, your interests lie and, and find that passion for, for what you wanna do after you graduate. Um, and so it's not uncommon for students to, to change degrees. Um, a few other things that we've heard a little bit about, we offer a study abroad program in, in the Galapagos uh, that's available to all of our undergraduate students, regardless of, of major. Um, the, the program is a semester long, it's, it's housed in the Galapagos. It's, uh, it's taught all by uh, UM faculty um, that sort of uh, come down to the Galapagos and, and teach courses in succession over that that semester. Um, one of the great things about this program compared to other study abroad programs is the fact that because it's being taught by UM faculty and their UM courses, you don't have to worry about those, um, those credits sort of transferring in and, and counting towards the, the, your degree requirements. Um, we also, if you aren't uh, able to go to the Galapagos, we also have a saltwater semester program that uh, operates in much the same way as the Galapagos program. Um, with the exception that it's it's housed here at, at UM and it's it's done at the at the Marine School. So students will spend for that semester, they'll spend all of their time at the Rosenstiel uh, School doing research in labs and taking courses um, in a small group format. Um, Thank you. Um, I just quickly wanted to leave a little yeah. bit of time for questions um, sure. if there are any. I think we had uh, one before that I wanted to relay to you, um, but which may have already been answered. Oh, is it possible to double major in marine biology and oceanography? Uh, marine biology and oceanography. Um, yeah, I mean, the, they both have significant uh, curriculum requirements. So it is, it is possible to do a, a double major um, in the two. Um, one of the common combinations is, is the marine science and, and biology double major. Um, and that kind of has the same flavor. Um, I think, you know, what happens is, is students come in and you get, you get started in the degree program and, and you work with our advisors. So all of the, the academic advisors for students are, are the research faculty and they'll work with you to figure out, you know, what combination of, of majors really suits your best interests and where you want to go in your career. So, you know, it's good to have a sense of, of what degree you want to pursue, but I think it's, it's good to sort of come into it with an open mind and realize that it's very likely that you'll sort of move around and, and explore various options. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, are there any last questions for Dr. Klaus? I think we're almost at time. All right, um, if that is the case, then I will say thank you so much um, for presenting on undergraduate opportunities. Um, oh, we have one question about transfer students, but I will have that answered in the chat. Um, Maybe, uh, Dr. Klaus, if you could stay on for just a moment and um, check out the Q&A um, and type any answers that might come in. So if sure, you do have questions yeah. still for Dr. Klaus, feel free to type them in in the Q&A and he can answer them uh, there. So thank you again. Uh, and now we will be moving along to our laboratories. So this section, we're going to take about uh, five minutes for uh, five different laboratories. And we're going to uh, go through those. So our first one is uh, at our aquaculture and hatchery, which is just across the street um, next to NOAA. And we have quite a big section there. Uh, Ron, are you here? Hi, everyone. I'm Ariana. I'm an MPS student here at the Rosenfield School. <laughs> Um, and we are going to introduce Ron Honig here, and he is the manager for the experimental hatchery here at the 
Hi, welcome everybody to University of Miami's Experimental Hatchery and home to our aquaculture program. We'll take a quick look uh, at some of the things we have going on uh, right now. Currently, we are conducting our aquaculture two lab class. One of our students here is getting ready to do feeding. So, two tanks here. We have some uh, larval shrimp going for the first time ever at the facility. We're primarily focused on marine fin fish, and those are mostly tropical species looking at. Cobia, mahi mahi, red snapper, yellowtail snapper, Japanese flounder. And then um, we've messed around with a few crustaceans, including the Florida stone crab. So we look at uh, a lot of hands on research here, practical training. We have academic programs. Uh, we have one undergrad class uh, and a full track in aquaculture for MPS, Master of Science, and PhD. Uh, all of our students here at the university are welcome to participate in our lab and get some hands on experience. We can take a look at part of what the class is doing here is Cobia larva culture. So they're uh, taking eggs that came from our breeding fish. We hatched them out, and now the class is doing a hands on trial. They're actually testing the use of probiotics versus non-probiotic to both larval fish and larval shrimp. So uh, a lot of opportunities here for uh, working with the animals, learning basic husbandry, uh, as well as the uh, academic. Uh, so we In this tank here, as you'll see, we have our broodstock Japanese flounder. These fish are upwards of about 30 pounds, and they spawn regularly for us, volitionally. So all natural spawning. We'll take those eggs and do various trials, uh, stocking in the tanks you saw over there, as well as we will keep some and breed them out and continue to develop the genetics of the facility. We also here have a new, relatively new species to our facility. These are triple tail. These are born and raised here at the University of Miami Hatchery. And these will be some future breeding fish for us. So I don't know if uh, we have any questions. Unfortunately, we don't have time. Uh, our facility houses multiple species of broodstock. Uh, in much larger outdoor facilities. But certainly, any prospective students are welcome to come and take a tour of the facility and, and reach out to us if you have any questions about our aquaculture program. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, and yeah, you're, we'll have a Q&A at the end of this section um, at 2.30. So yeah, absolutely. Um, would love to get any questions about aquaculture. And if you have any questions now, feel free to type them into the Q&A. Um, thank you so much, Ron, and thank you, Michelle and Ariana. Um, all right, for our next section, uh, we have Dr. Nikki Trailer Knowles's uh, Nidarian Immunity Lab, and we're going to show a short video, but Dr. Trailer Knowles will be available during the Q&A as well to answer any questions. I'm not hearing any sound. I am Gwen Laboratory. Um, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Nikki Trailer Knowles, and this is my Gwen Laboratory. Um, my lab is called the Nadarian Immunity Lab, and we study uh, the uh, immune system of corals and sea anemones. We're really interested in understanding the mechanisms of, of the immune system, as well as understanding how we can harness the immune system to understand um, the health of corals and the health of sea anemones. We use a lot of different techniques, including um, medical techniques, such as flow cytometry and genomics to get to these answers about the immune system. And we also work on a lot of different coral species, some that are local and some that are found in the Eastern Pacific. So um, in our wet lab here, we actually keep the uh, um, corals that we work on. 
So here's an example of one of the corals. So you can see this is a, a proper cervicortis, and it's growing over the the peg that we have it on. So they're doing really well. These are notoriously hard to keep in the lab, but we've been doing okay with it. Um, and these were generously given to us uh, from the rescuer reef uh, lab, um, Dr. Dr. Uh, Diego Lehrman's lab is also here at the University of Miami. Um, we also have these corals that are called Potsopridama cornus. They are from the Eastern Pacific. Um, and you can also see again that they're growing over the, the pegs that they're on. So they're doing really well. And they have all kinds of different colors. This one's more brown. Um, and so we, we like to use these corals to look at um, how their immune systems react to different stressors, including heat stress, as well as disease. We do a lot of work on stony coral tissue loss disease, which is a disease currently running through the Caribbean and really affects the corals here in Miami. Um, and we're also, um, we also have sea anemones here, so I'll show you here. Oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> so we have these anemones that we keep, not as charismatic as coral, but they're very, very useful. So if you look closely, what you can see is there's sand, but you see these little brown lines here? Those are the um, sea anemones. And what we can do is we can take individual sea anemones, put them in a bowl with the sand, and they'll clone themselves. So for example, this one here is clone one that we've been keeping since um, March uh, 2018. So we've been growing all these different clones. And what we do is we study the um, regenerative capacity of, of these animals. Um, and how what's really neat about them is that if you cut off their head or tail, they'll grow it back and they'll do it really quickly. So we're interested in the mechanisms of that, including stem cells um, and what uh, as well as, you know, understanding and using these animals as a model for corals. So these, as you can see, we just keep them in this like dark cabinet. So they're really easy to keep. And they're really easy to work on um, and much easier to work on actually than corals. So sometimes we use these animals um, to try out different techniques and then we can apply it to the corals. Thank you so much for joining me on my lab tour. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. And also, um, you know, if you're interested in volunteering in my lab, we always have opportunities both for master students and um, undergrads to volunteer in the lab. We're not currently um, uh, recruiting any graduate students, but that could change. It always possibly changes. Um, so hope to see you at the Rosenstiel soon. Thank you so much. Um, and Dr. Trailer Knowles is on uh, the Q&A right now. If you want to type any questions for her into the um, into the Q and A, she can type the answers now, and then she'll also be available when we reach our Q and A portion at two thirty. But for now, we'll go ahead and um, show our next uh, little brief tour of our Sustain Lab. Hello, everyone. My name is Payson Tan. I'm a fourth year PhD student working in the School Rosenstiel School of Marine Atmospheric and Earth Science. And behind me is my lab. It's called Sustain Lab. The full name is Surge Structure Air Sea Interaction Facility, Sustain for short. It's a wave tank, as you can see, but it's not an ordinary wave tank. It is actually a hurricane simulator. We can blow wind all the way to a category five hurricane in this lab. And this is so far the world's only lab to do so. And this is where I'm doing my PhD. Pretty exciting, right? So my project focuses on how wind is powering the water under extreme wind conditions. So this lab is perfect for it. I study how waves interact with wind under tropical depression, tropical cyclone, or hurricanes, which is a very hot and vital topic for residents of South Florida. Because if you study those, we can have a better understanding of how we can prepare if these 
natural disaster come to hit us and how do we build coastal protection method and eventually this project will provide South Florida residents with a safer tomorrow. Um, this lab can also host a variety of other research. We have ongoing research about DARPA projects sponsored by the National Defense Military uh, Administration in Washington, D.C. Basically, we're studying how reefs are going to mitigate the waves, which I'll show you the models when we come into our tank. And also, this lab can host internship for students at different levels. So high school students, we have high school students coming in from Mass Academy every semester. And we have undergraduate student intern, we can get them paid through UM projects so they can uh, they can get their hands on some of the world um, top notch technologies, learn science, collaborate with scientists. And this will be actually a very good next step if they want to apply for grad school or to enter the industry. And we also have Master of Professional Science students, and we host their internship with people, with the professor scientists here. So it will be a very uh, beneficial for them if they want to enter a similar career path, like ocean engineering, coastal protection, et cetera. And of course, we have this lab for graduate students. I'm a PhD student, so this is a perfect place for me to do my research. We have a uh, master of ocean engineering student coming in every semester to do their research and test their models and they all end up in a very very good career path so please follow me let me show you more about this lab from inside so from here to here is 23 meter long which is around 60 feet cross section is six meter which is around um 20, 25 feet, and the height is two meter, which is around eight, seven feet high. So it's a pretty big tank. It is able to host 400,000 gallons of water. And here we can see lots of structures. These are artificial reefs that we're about to deploy along the coast of South Florida because the reef mitigates wave energy. So by deploying these reefs, we'll be able to make the wave break offshore instead of onshore so that we can have a better idea of coastal protection and prevent us from flooding, coastal inundation, and eventually improve the well-being of people in South Florida. We have different reef models that we have trying to plant on those artificial breakwater. So you can test the ideal ratio of how much rainfall we need, how much step will we need. So we'll have the most ideal and the best solution for coastal protection. And this is the DARPA project that I was talking about earlier. Thank you for touring the Sustain Lab. My name is Payson Tan. I work in this lab and let me know if you have any questions because I will be in the Q&A section. Great, thank you. All right, um, now we will go ahead and move on to our uh, climate uh, modeling research group with one of our students, Austin Boskos. Hey everyone, uh, sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, my name is Austin Boz, guys. I have a bachelor's in physics from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and I'm currently a second year RAS or master's student at Rasmus. I work with Dr. Amy Clement studying public heat exposure in Miami, but my specific contribution involves writing code in Python to uh, analyze mountains of climate and temperature data so that we can draw conclusions from the results. Uh, my research group works under the hypothesis that heat in Miami is unlike any other in the country. And that's not just me saying that it's hot, it is, but also our typical daily temperatures are high enough that other cities would classify them as part of a heat wave. In other words, we in Miami are typically experiencing heat at or just below dangerous levels on a daily basis. This leads my urban heat research group, which was set up by the U-Link program at U uh, University of Miami to wonder if the heat alert system of Miami and other associated programs 
should follow their own separate procedures or should they continue to be like the rest of the countries? The people that I work with are an interdisciplinary group that consists of community psychologists, um, social scientists, epidemiologists, and atmospheric scientists that are all trying to answer how can we describe this heat? What are the effects on human health? And how uh, can we best communicate our findings to the public? Also meet with um, policymakers, agency representatives, and other engaged citizens so that we can hear their concerns and incorporate them into both our methodology and the findings that we eventually share back with them. And I, I gotta say like that particular aspect, uh, you know, speaking as like a desk jockey can be kind of confusing at times. It's like this complex social machine with some political undertones and a lot of moving parts, but it, I don't know, just sitting along for the ride can be entertaining sometimes. Yeah. Not much. But anyway, my main contribution, like I des described before, involves taking large sets of atmospheric data and representing them graphically. This is a graph uh, describing the daily feels like temperature for a typical Miami summer. And these are the categories that the National Weather Service has described as threatening the human health. Uh, looking back on the graph, you can see that I've overlaid these same categories on top of the distribution. And immediately what you can tell is the vast majority of the days fall under some sort of category for concern. Which is interesting considering Miami as represented on these graphs by these little orange boxes here. Miami very rarely issues heat alerts. According to a paper by Hondelum uh, that came out last year, uh, Miami's heat alerts as represented by the dependent axis on both of these graphs, Miami's heat alerts are actually some of the rarest in the country, despite the fact that Miami has both the hottest summers or some of the hottest summers and some of the highest rates of uh, heat attributable mortality. So now you can understand why we're so concerned. And when I'm not working on my main project, um, I'm usually helping individual members of the group to acquire data. For example, someone might need a list of extreme heat periods, another uh, might need uh, monthly average temperatures over a specific time period, uh, which is actually kind of harder to get than you might think. It's usually small things like that, but being able to get them, that data is crucial to the scientific process because now they don't have to waste time in a domain that they're unfamiliar with. And you might be inclined to say that sounds like a lot of extra work, but as somebody who fell in love with science purely because it means I get to code, I, I don't mind the practice. And uh, yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Austin. Um, and Austin will also be available for questions if you have any questions. So feel free to drop any in the Q&A if you have them. Uh, our last speaker for our labs will be Dr. Frederick Hanselman, who is going to talk about our underwater archaeology program. All right. Hey, everyone. Um, welcome to our virtual campus here. Uh, I will try to be brief because I know we, we are limited on time. Um, and I figured for this particular uh, presentation, I would talk about um, our near campus laboratory. While we do have space on campus for um, drawing up our maps and creating our photogrammetric models and things like that, um, I thought it would highlight, you know, the uniqueness of the our campus and what we have access to here just locally offshore. Um, so here are some of the classes we offer. This is also found online, so I don't need to uh, belabor the point, but we have a, a variety of courses within underwater maritime archaeology, um, and there are a few of them that are actually very applicable across disciplines, such as site mapping and visualization and geophysical survey and technology, which includes um, seafloor mapping. Uh, we work with partners in Biscay National Park. Here you can see a couple of archaeologists looking at a pile of cannonballs um, and shot from a shipwreck that was discovered a few years ago. We work with Dry Tortugas National Park. Uh, bottom right hand is a wooden shipwreck within the park waters and a few of us mapping um, that site. We also work in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Um, we recently had a research cruise to the Quicksands area. You can see in the uh, yellow box there 
we're looking for and assessing um, shipwreck sites uh, with NOAA as uh, one of our partners. Uh, we also work on deep water sites using ROVs and research vessels. And one of the things that's actually pretty neat about this, this aspect is um, we use telepresence and that we can um, stream our research and, and our work live in real time um, to people uh, online and also to other scientists at Exploration Command Centers around the country. And we, we actually have a, an Exploration Command Center here uh, in the Abbas Center and at the Rosensteel School. Um, and so these are pretty unique opportunities and, and when we can get into them, we do. Um, we also have kind of more of your contractual projects, uh, which include offshore energy clearance, sand reclamation. Uh, as you can see, this program is um, very heavy on the diving. Uh, and I'm also the director of the scientific diving and boating program. So if there are any questions about that later on, and, and I'm still here, um, I can field those as well. Uh, but it's not just shipwrecks, right? There are submerged prehistoric sites in the Gulf of Mexico um, and in the Florida Keys and offshore in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, this particular project, we were assisting the State Bureau of Archaeological Research uh, on a, a submerged prehistoric site from about 8,000 years ago. Um, and that's one of the things that I think is really neat about archaeology. We can actually look at how humans interacted with the environment in the past and how that might actually uh, educate us as to what we might do better, uh, one would hope. And so here you can see in these three images is where the coastline of Florida is predicted to have been 16,000 years ago, 9,000 years ago, and where it is now. And the red dot is actually um, the site where Manasota Key offshore is. And so you can see that when it was active 9,000 years ago, it was actually a terrestrial site, and now it's underwater. So one of the big kind of questions we have in underwater archaeology is, you know, who were the first people that arrived in the Americas and where those first settlement sites are going to be is now submerged. So we also own Little Salt Spring, which has Paleo-Indian and archaic components. So 13,000 to 8,000 um, before present. Um, and we also work internationally in the Bahamas. This particular project is in Mexico, the Lost Ships of Cortez project, looking for um, sunken conquistador shipwrecks to highlight kind of the collision of cultures and the advent of globalization um, through these. And here you can see an anchor with a wooden stock, which the wood usually decomposes. So that was a nice treat. Um, and we work with experimental technology that is uh, applicable across disciplines. So here you have um, an aerial drone magnetometer that can be used for unexploded ordnance, um, finding that, or also finding shipwrecks. Uh, a handheld diver um, magnetometer. This is a prototype that we've been working on, and it's just now um, being released commercially. Uh, camera array systems for benthic mapping, site mapping, um, and one of our most recent projects was uh, with the DOD um, and the De Department of Defense's POW MIA accounting agency doing some forensic archaeology and locating uh, military losses. In this particular case, uh, B-25 that sank in 1943 or 1944, excuse me, um, and then documenting that and then mapping that. Um, and so that's one of the things I really think is cool about archaeology is it really connects us to the past. So you can think about the sailors and, and the, the men and women and the people that were on these vessels and, you know, the spoon that somebody may have eaten their last meal with and the bottle of ginger that the ship's medical officer prescribed when the seas turned and people started getting seasick to the ship's log that the first mate uh, documented the um, the deteriorating, deteriorating conditions to the, the sole of a shoe, which speaks to the finality of a wrecking event. Um, and I think that's what's neat about archaeology. And we've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, and so if there's any questions, um, feel free to ask them. And, and that's what I've got. Thank you so much, Dr. Hanselman. That was great. Um, does anyone have any questions? If so, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. Um, in the meantime, I guess I had a quick question for Dr. Triller Knowles, which was just, um, you talked a little bit about getting um, some of your corals from another coral lab on campus. And I guess I just wondered what level of collaboration is there between um, different labs in the marine biology and ecology department? Yeah, um, there's a lot of uh, collaboration between the laboratories here. At the Rosensteel, we're really lucky. We have four main labs that are working on coral reefs. So we really have a hub of coral reef research going on. So I collaborate with the Learman lab to get corals. I collaborate with um, the Baker lab 
on different projects. They study the um, symbiosis of coral, the Reef Futures Lab. Um, a, I work sometimes with Chris Langdon, who works on ocean acidification in corals. Um, and so, you know, we all kind of work together in different ways on different projects. And um, also um, through NOAA, I collaborate with people that are working on corals there um, and actually co-advise students. So there's a lot of, it's a very collaborative environment. Um, and lastly, I'll just say that I also am like on a lot of committees for different um, graduate students. So um, you definitely get to be sort of in the, the hub of coral reef science. So, yeah. Oop, you're muted, Andrew. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> that was a great answer. Um, I had a question also um, uh, for Ron right now, which was, uh, what kinds of fish do we generally work with on aquaculture? Is it primarily food or do we also do um, non-sustenance um, fish raising? For example, uh, maybe endangered species and things like that. So currently we are focused uh, primarily on food fish. So, and, and more specifically tropical marine fish species. So um, that doesn't mean we can't apply the techniques we're using in our hatchery to do stuff like stock enhancement. Uh, we've done a lot of ecotoxicology work providing a consistent supply of test animals uh, in collaboration with Ecotox uh, Lab here. Uh, looking at the impacts of Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So we can we can apply the techniques to a lot of different uh, applications just to produce fish, but our, you know, we generally pick species that taste good. <laughs> You're still muted, Andrew. This is like how many years of Zoom and I'm still muted. I, I don't know how it happens, but it does. Um, for Austin, I had a quick question, which is, have are there any kinds of opportunities for graduate students to do conferences and things like that that you have personally had? Uh, yes, actually, I attended the AMS conference in Colorado just this winter. Great. Thank you. Um, excellent. Any last questions? If not, I want to take a moment just to thank all of our labs for participating and for sharing all of your uh, research and for talking to uh, our webinar. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, up next, uh, we will have our campus resources. So this section, we're going to go around campus a little bit with a couple of film teams, and we will have uh, a look at our dive pool, at our waterfront restaurant and bar, and at our library. Hi, everybody. My name is Michelle Fernandez. I'm a PhD student here at the Rosenstiel School. And right now we are in the commons area. So this is kind of like the hub of our campus so we have a lot of classrooms here. We have our auditorium and our restaurant. Um, we have a privately owned restaurant called Salt on this campus as well. And so we also have in the commons a beautiful aquarium that's actually fully maintained by students. So if anyone is really interested in aquarium husbandry, you can get involved um, with the aquarium club as a way to get involved on campus. And so now we're gonna enter Salt. So this is our private restaurant that I was talking about. So this is open weekdays, 11.30 to 2.30. We have a beautiful view of the bay here. And so a lot of students do work here or studying while they're eating lunch. So this is a really big part of our campus. And then here also we have something called Wet Lab. So Wet Lab is our on-campus bar. And so this is open. Uh, Wednesdays through Fridays at five o'clock for happy hour. And so we do events like uh, uh, trivia. We also do karaoke. 
And so this is a way for students, faculty, and members of the public to kind of get together in a really unique way. And here you can see close up. And then with that, we'll head outside and we'll show you our beautiful patio and beautiful So this is our private beach. Uh, so students can come and use this beach um, whenever they want, even on the weekends. So you can swim here, tan, do homework, whatever you'd like. You can eat lunch here on the patio, look out over the beautiful uh, ocean view. We see a lot of animals here. So we've seen manatees, dolphins, spotted eagle rays, all kinds of amazing um, fauna. And we'll head now this way so we can see our beach access. And so here is where students can enter the beach. Um, you can take chairs, towels, whatever you'd like. Um, and it's a beautiful day today, so everyone can see just how nice it is to go to school here. Yes, and so I'm Ariana, like I mentioned earlier, I'm an MPS student and I'm just researching marine conservation here at UM. Um, I do always love to talk about how we have mangroves on campus. Um, Florida only has three different species of mangrove, but on this campus, we actually have all three different species. So we have white, red, and black mangroves on this campus. I think we may have lost them by the dive training. Here we are. Okay, good. So, what was that? Nothing, just lost you for a moment. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, so, this is um, where those scientific diving classes and free diving classes are held. Um, UM is pretty unique in having those classes. Um, those classes are held here um, for graduate students. You can also get involved in this pool by doing um, strength training. So, you can sign up for strength training. Um, slots and come here, swim laps, practice your diving techniques and things like that. Back behind the pool, there's also a beach volleyball court over there. So it's another place for students, faculty, everyone to unwind and have a good time. We like to do um, volleyball tournaments sometimes. So we get a bunch of groups together and we play volleyball. For those, for the scientific diving class, you do achieve a AAUS certification through that course. Um, but that's different than any kind of PADI or NAWI certification that you would get recreationally. Now we are heading toward our dock. So we're going to see where all of our small boats and our research vessel is held. However, our research vessel is not here right now. Um, we may see a couple of the boats. We do have 10, a fleet of 10 small boats on this campus. Um, they range from 15 to 36 feet. We also have a um, scientific boating course where you can achieve a motorboat operations um, certification through that class. Um, and yeah, so you see some of the boats in our fleet here. However, our research vessel is not here. So just imagine a 96 foot long um, research vessel on this dock as well. 
The research vessel is named um, the Walton Smith after our founder. Um, it was built in 1999 and went into service in 2000. It mainly does oceanographic research and chemical oceanographic research specifically. Um, and the way to get involved in that boat is just by, um, it's like all the other labs, just getting involved by emailing, seeing if you um, are available, if anyone's available to take on researchers, to take on volunteers, you can get involved with those cruises. They range from two weeks to a couple days. Um, and then it also goes all the way as north as New York, and sometimes it goes to Bermuda or the Bahamas and things like that. It's a really nice day. <laughs> All right, and with that, I think we're ready to hand it back over to Heidi um, if she wants to start the tour of our library. I think you might be muted. Over. Hey everyone, my name is Marie. Uh, I'm currently an MPS student here in the Marine Conservation Track. Um, I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, and went and did my undergrad up in Nova Scotia, um, studying marine biology and science communications, and continuing that field here at um, the Rosenstiel School, and just got an internship across the street at our NOAA facility um, in that science communications um, internship, so looking forward to that. Uh, I also want to point out, um, I'm a commuter student, so um, I use a lot of the resources that um, are very helpful here on campus. Normally we have a shuttle here that will show up um, all throughout the day that goes from Rosensteel all the way to main campus and goes back and forth. Um, and is a great way for students to commute um, and find their way back to campus um, and back to our main campus during the day. So next we'll head up to our library. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Our campus here is mainly based with um, our master's and PhD students. So our um, undergraduate students don't find themselves on this campus too much, but we do have our nice beach like you just saw um, and other facilities as well where you guys can definitely use um, as well as our library. So we are on Breezeway here, um, which holds our library, but also um, some of our administrative offices and some other classrooms that students um, normally spend their time in. Um, but our fun spot here is our library, which is just around the corner. So before we head into the library, I'll point out this beautiful bulletin board here holds a lot of information about things happening on campus. We have our schedule here for that shuttle that I mentioned outside. And we also have a lot of other postings about internships, about different uh, talks and dissertations, uh, as well as outreach events happening on campus like beach cleanups um, and other fun things that gets everyone involved, main campus and Rosenstiel campus all together. And here is our library. So we are in the Rosenstiel Library. This is one of seven branches of the University of Miami system. Um, it holds a lot of different articles and books, mainly about marine biology, um, atmospheric and earth sciences, obviously. Um, and we also have a bunch of different areas to study in. We also offer um, smaller little rooms that you can rent out for group work or interviews or things like that. I'll show you over here, we have some more spots. We also have beautiful postings and pictures here. Um, we offer a photo contest for our students, um, which is a great opportunity if you're into underwater photography. Um, you can definitely register for that and see if you want anything cool. Um, but also, have a bunch of rooms here and different big um, tables to join in, but we also offer a bunch of different um, services with our amazing librarians who are well-versed in everything with coding systems and GIS, which are all free um, with the university. So definitely helpful with all of that and whatever activities you guys get into in terms of your courses. 
um, let us know if you have any questions um, about the library or any services. Um, we're here to help you guys and we offer a lot of different things and can definitely help any questions you have. Great. Um, so we actually have a little bit of time here, but I got one question already and feel free to drop more in the chat if you have any about our facilities, about the campus, about uh, anything with campus life. Um, but we have one question about for MPS students in, uh, in marine biology, but really in anything, will all of the classes be on the Rosensteel campus or some of their classes on the main campus at Coral Gables? Marik, do you want to try taking that? Could you repeat the question one more time? Yeah. So for MPS students uh, at the Rosensteel School, will all of their classes be on our campus here on Virginia Key on the island, or will they be on the main campus as well? Sorry, for just MPS students? Yeah, or for yeah. grad students in general. Yep, so there's um, a wide range of different opportunities that can happen. So you can either be mainly on this campus doing research. Um, we offer a lot of classes that actually do field work outside of our um, Biscayne campus, but um, we can also take on main campus classes, which I actually have one on main campus. So can go back and forth depending on the different classes you choose and the different track that you're in. Great. Um, I have one other question, and I see that um, we're also going to have uh, Ariana and Michelle back in a moment. And since all of you are students, I guess I'm just really curious to know why you chose to come to the Rosensteel School versus going somewhere else. Why did you apply here? Yeah. Um, so my main thing for applying to the MPS program was that I loved the aspect of having a fast track master's, um, but mainly because I wanted to get into the work field um, and do kind of that science communication aspect that I talked about before. Um, so having that opportunity to do some classes and then have that real world experience in an internship with an organization was really what attracted me to the program. And now I'm doing that. So it's been great. Wonderful. Ariana, do I have you here as well? You and Michelle? Yeah. Oh, turn this way. That's super. Uh, I'm here, but I can talk about why uh, <laughs> I chose to come here. <laughs> um, sure. So I started out doing my MPS, Master of Professional Science degree here. And um, I kind of knowingly chose that as like a springboard into a PhD. So I knew the whole time that I wanted to get um, eventually into a PhD program. So it's just a lot of different applications for our MPS program. You can use it to go into even higher education or to get out into the job uh, workforce. But I chose it because I come from a business background, undergraduate actually. So I use the MPS to get kind of like a very cohesive and uh, quick, since it's our accelerated one-year master's background in marine bio. Um, and then I use that to kind of have the experience necessary to go into a PhD program. Great. Um, Ariana, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, so I actually chose this program because I knew that I wanted to go back to school. I took like an eight month hiatus. It wasn't a full year off of school after undergrad, but I knew that I wanted to um, go back to school. And so I decided on UOM because we have such a large, I didn't know exactly what track I wanted to do, but there's 14 different tracks. So being able to have that option was really cool. Um, also, I know we talked about the uh, Rosensteel Opportunity Award. I actually got the award. So that was actually a big, um, a big proponent for me too. Like I have the advantage of being able to come here and that covers a lot of my tuition. So it was a really good opportunity for me to come to UM, especially be able to work with all the amazing professors here. I was looking through the website and was amazed at every single person's um, resume and thing like things like that. So it just feels like I'm in a place where I can get a lot of experience and um, meet people from a lot of different fields in marine science that I maybe didn't know that I was interested in. And now I have a lot of interest in a lot of different things, but it's okay because I'm getting an education in all of them. <laughs> Good, that's a great answer. Um, so I have a couple more questions and I'd love for you all to field them if you feel comfortable with it. Um, but uh, do undergraduates have opportunities for research or to use our various facilities and equipment or is it all more for graduate students? I have an answer on this, but if you all have an answer that you would give, then please go ahead. 
So undergrads definitely do have opportunities to use all of our facilities. Undergrads can come here whenever they'd like. Um, if you're just relying on your coursework, I'd say that you would be here mainly freshman year, but it, it's totally up to you. If you want to volunteer in a lab, if you want to get a paid position, we have those as well for labs, um, then you'll be here as often as you want to be and how often your lab schedule uh, permits you to be. And I think that that's kind of the beauty of it is you really have a lot of leeway with like how often you want to be here, but you can definitely use all of our facilities and volunteer in our labs. Great. I would just add that um, there's also just a lot of opportunities for undergraduates to help out with various kinds of research trips on our um, research vessels. There's also opportunities for undergraduates to get certified in various kinds of diving. Um, and so there are definitely opportunities there. Part of it is just like that you're physically living on the other campus, but the other campus is uh, not that far away. So and again, just to repeat, we have a shuttle between the two that is kind of centered around your classes. But the other thing is that all undergraduates will wind up taking um, some research labs on our campus. So you'll definitely have an opportunity, even if you don't volunteer at any of those labs to use the facilities here as well. Um, next question was what kind of professional development opportunities are there in the Master of Professional Science program? So I would love to pass that to uh, any of you all, if you have any thoughts on it. Michelle, Ariana, still there? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> the as far as coursework, there are a couple of classes that could actually Help with your professional development. So there are some um, scientific writing courses that are really important if you're like going into um, any scientific communication or even for scientists who work in a more of a lab setting, they still have to write papers, write grants, things like that. So there are coursework that help with those kinds of things. Um, other than that, we also do have webinars, several webinars every semester um, that Chelsea and Kayla pretty much put together. And so those um, help MPS students, mainly MPS students, um, with different career paths that they're thinking about. And then the internship is probably our biggest um, career springboard opportunity. Usually internships are a way to start exploring the types of careers that you wanna get into after um, you're finished with your degree. Yes, that's great. And I would just add that um, the whole design of the program is meant to allow you to have that internship as a professional development opportunity. The point of having it be a professional, a master of professional science is simply that if you get an opportunity to have hands-on experience in a work role in that science field, then that in a sense will be a really great thing on your resume when you are graduating and are able to say, yes, this is what kind of professional development I have had while doing this master's degree. Um, great. Any further questions? I just want to add to Andrew oh, right um, that I find that being in this environment and on campus and with everyone kind of in the same boat trying to find internships, we all kind of learn from each other and being able to network at SALT and in kind of the comments that you guys saw as well as um, writing emails and putting out your cover letters and, and um, CVs and all that, that also is just kind of builds your own kind of confidence and and trying to find um, internship positions and networking and um, that professional kind of building sense. Thank you, that is very helpful. Uh, I have one last question, which is um, what facilities do you find yourself using the most or find most useful? I definitely will say that kind of the commons area as well as our MPS lounges that we have um, are great facilities, um, not only to do work in, but um, also to meet new people and, and kind of hang out. Um, so that would be kind of, that would be my answer. Great. Ariana or Michelle, do you have a different one? Um, I use the library a lot, actually. Um, I like to get a lot of my information out of like paper books for some reason. I have checked out several books. Um, so I use the library a lot. It's also a really quiet space. So I do best reading in like quiet, like solitary spaces like that. So the library is 
super helpful for me, but also the spaces that Marie talked about. Great. All right. Well, we have one more question that I wanted to get to as well, which is um, when it's recommended to begin applying for scholarships. Um, I would say that, uh, I'll take this one, um, but as far as scholarships go, in general, all of our master's degrees are self-funded. And so that means that uh, most students rely on a combination of either uh, money from themselves or family or alternately from uh, student loans, things like that. And the third option, and one that we do really encourage students to pursue, is that organizations uh, around the country and the world provide outside fellowships for graduate study. And in the past, we've had students get things like NSF grants to fund this um, and uh, grants from other organizations. So it's definitely worth doing a search online um, to try to find out what options there might be for outside funding. Um, that said, I would say that for the master professional science, there are slightly more opportunities for funding from within the school, but these are not like uh, vast resources for funding. There are just some opportunities. Um, on our website, if you go to the financing your education section on the MPS site, you can see a number of different outside scholarships that people have won in uh, recent years. And those are definitely worth thinking about applying to if they seem like a good fit for you. The other things I would mention are just that we offer, um, and this is only for the Master of Professional Science, not for the Master of Science. We offer, based on your undergraduate GPA, or alternately, even though we don't require the GRE, you're welcome to submit a GRE and we can take that into consideration too. But we offer merit-based tuition reduction for the MPS, meaning that if you have a certain level of GPA, um, then we will automatically give you 10% off of the cost of tuition. And if you have a slightly higher GPA, then you would get 20% off of the cost of tuition. So that can reduce tuition costs significantly. Um, and what Ariana uh, mentioned and what we mentioned before, the Rosenstiel Opportunity Award is an award that is meant for students who are traditionally underrepresented in the natural sciences. Um, but that is an award that if you want to apply for it, um, you definitely would want to submit your application before March 1st of any year. And then we usually announce that award in April. So even though our application is open through June for uh, fall 2023, if you want to apply for the Rosenstiel Opportunity Award, you would definitely want to get your application in before March. Um, so that is the kind of answer I have for that. Um, but yeah, if you have more questions about financing your education, absolutely have a look at our website um, and feel free to also reach out to me. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, all right, I think we are at time. So we're now in our uh, last section of today. Um, so thank you for sticking with us through it. Um, so our last section is on campus life, and we have five different groups from around campus, and we're going to give each of them five minutes to talk about what they do. So our first speaker will be for our Canes on Canes organization, Alexis Wilson, please. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Alexis. Give me a second while I pull up our little slideshow that we have for this. Hi, I'm Alexis. Um, I am a PhD student here at Rasmus. I study hurricane formation and I am the president of a group we call Canes on Canes, which is a hurricane science and preparedness outreach group that reaches out a lot to our local community to help educate them on the science of hurricanes and the preparedness. And hello, I have a cat here. So a little bit more about what we are. We are, as mentioned, a hurricane outreach group and some of the local schools we give talks to are elementary through college schools. And there's a variety of community groups as well that we often reach out to, to help give conversations and talks about. Some of those include, uh, we have the Frost Museum of Science that we often do tabling events at, and we get to talk to a lot of elementary school kids about what's going on, what is a hurricane, 
how does it form and things like that. And they're all very interested in that. And we also uh, talk to a lot of parents and other people in the local community about how they can better prepare in case we do get hurricanes because they are frequent here in Miami. Uh, we are looking to expand some of our relief to uh, both locally to other museums outside of Frost and a bit more nationally because with the prevalence of Zoom and those kind of virtual things, we've actually gotten some people reaching out to us asking if we could come and give some talks in their classroom that aren't at in within Miami because hurricanes do affect a lot of places nationwide outside of just the small part of Southern Florida that we're in. So we are comprised of PhD masters and MPS students. We are very much also open to undergrads. We'd love to have y'all. We don't currently have any and it would be great to see some more younger representation in us as well. And it is a fairly low time commitment because the way we end up working, we usually have maybe one meeting, group meeting a semester. And beyond that, we often have a bunch of these outreach events where we only need a couple of people at and people just sign up for things that you are available to do. So even if you have a really busy semester and can't do it at all, you don't have to sign up for anything that semester. Or if you have a more free semester and there are things you're really interested in choosing, we definitely have a lot of those things available, particularly in the fall during hurricane season, where we have a lot of outreach events to talk to the community. Hurricane-focused research is not required. It is helpful, um, particularly for the more college and high school age, where they have a lot more in-depth questions, but especially for some of those museum talks and for the um, like elementary school age, it is not required to actually know like in-depth stuff about hurricanes. And it is really helpful for the community to help to share a lot of the information we have on hurricane preparedness, not just hurricane specific science. And it's a great way to get involved in the community to really talk to a lot of the people, get to know their experiences. A lot of times, particularly with older groups, we hear them talk about Hurricane Andrew, which happened back in 92 and a lot of their experiences with that, which as someone who's on the younger side and was not around for Hurricane Andrew is really interesting to hear about and to hear about the local impacts that a lot of people experienced then. It's also a great way to practice presentation skills and the science communication skills, which is really important for us as scientists. So how to get involved, obviously come to UM. We'd love to have you here. Um, you can reach out to me for any more information. My name's Alexis again, and Brian McNoldy, who is, you may see on TV a lot, and he does a lot of um, interviews and specials with a lot of local media as well about hurricanes and weather in general. He's our faculty advisor, and he would also be more than happy to talk to you. And I would be happy to answer any questions here as well. Thank you, Alexis. If you have any questions um, for Alexis, you're welcome again to drop them into the Q&A uh, or for any of our speakers following this. We'll also have some time for questions after we're finished with this section. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and pass it along to our next speaker, who is the head of our graduate student organization, Seeking Equity and Success, or SEAS, uh, Lisa Isma. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you, Andrew, for that. So I'm going to share my screen with you all. So yes, um, as Andrew said, I am uh, currently the multicultural chair of the Marine Science Graduate Student Organization. And my responsibilities and the great honor that I've been given here um, is running Seeking Equity and Success um, in SEAS. So, SEAS is a marine science graduate student organization that was founded um, after the murder of George Floyd to be a safe space for discussion. We, on, we are unapologetically black and devoted to increasing racial diversity in the sciences, but of course, everyone is welcome. Our conversations occur monthly at 2 p.m. on the last Monday of the month, and we hope to see you there when you come here and to share with an open mind. Um, I would also like to add that we take a poll at the beginning of every semester um, to find a time that is best for, for a student body. 
And so this time is likely to change. And of course the commitment is low, it's one hour a month. And the goal is just so that students have a safe space to, dis to discuss topics that would probably be harder for them to talk to their, their faculty PI about or anyone else. Um, and our past conversations include topics including equity, justice, and law, intersectional identities, racism and prejudice. And last year, we were able to, to use our funds to be able to fund the first Seize Diversity Scholarship. Um, and this is incredible in that I believe it's Frozen Steel's first scholarship that was founded by students for students. Um, and so I don't necessarily have all the paperwork done yet, but I can almost guarantee that in the coming years we'll be able to fund two scholarships of $500. Um, and in order to qualify, students would have to be self-funded um, and attend at least three SEEDS meetings or write a three to 400 word blog post about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion that we would be able to post on our SEEDS website. And this is just what our meeting schedule looks like for this semester. Um, and this is a safe space to have conversations and they will happen once a month with our next meeting being um, April 24th at 2 p.m. And lastly, I just wanted to let everybody know where they can contact me if they needed any more information about joining C's, being able to participate in our meetings when you hopefully do accept um, a position at the Rosensteel School. And also if you had any questions about the C's diversity scholarship and how you could apply or when or anything like that. Um, like I said, my name is Liz Isma and my email is below and you can scan that QR code. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Lise. And uh, if we have any questions, you're welcome to drop them in the chat for uh, Lise and uh, also for Alexis. And they'll also be available at the end if there are any questions that you think of then. For now, we can go ahead and we'll move on to our MSGSO and also sustainability student groups. And MSGSO is our Marine Science Graduate Student Organization. And for both of those groups, uh, we're going to have Remedy Rule. Hello, everyone. So I will be first sharing about the Marine Science Graduate Student Organization. So uh, what does MSGSO do? So um, Lise mentioned one aspect of MSGSO, the multicultural and diversity events. Um, overall, we want to enhance the student experience. Uh, we fundraise for the student travel fund. We design and sell Rosensteel merchandise, as well as provide social and professional development events. Uh, so for the merchandise, um, all the Rosensteel merchandise is designed and sold through MSGSO. So if you are interested in helping design a logo, um, you can contact our merchandise chair, Fabrizio, and all the proceeds from merchandise go to the student travel fund. Um, and volunteering to sell or package the merchandise, again, is, um, will help you earn SCF points, which I think will be touched on a little bit more later. Uh, if you are going to be a prospective student or you decided you are coming to Rosensteel, if you want to rep, uh, you can buy some merchandise at the online store, um, and this is the link to it below. This is some of the items we're offering in a um, MSGSO also hosts social events. Um, yearly, we'll have a Halloween party. We do beach cleanups um, in collaboration with SEAS. We did a multicultural potluck. Um, we just had a trivia night last night with Waterlust Trivia um, uh, and lots of other things to be involved in. So if you have an event in mind or want to get more involved, you can email our current chair, which is Burfin. Uh, I'll touch more about the sustainability initiative after this PowerPoint, but overall, the sustainability initiative's goal is to strengthen the intersection of science and sustainability by building environmental awareness and community through outreach activities and seminars. So, um, as I mentioned, I'll, I'll go into more detail about this group next. Uh, Lise already did a great job um, covering 
uh, what SEAS does, so I won't um, go into this, but it is cool. We do have a lot of aspects of MSGSO. It's not just like we do one thing or trying to uh, enhance the student experience in many ways. Uh, fundraising is a huge part of MSGSO, so we want to raise money for activities uh, like hosting all those Halloween parties usually we'll have um, people will get a ticket and they can get a free drink and a free food. Um, so the MSGSO can use their money for that, as well as the student travel fund. So if your internship um, or involves traveling or if you want to go to a conference that's related to what your internship is, uh, you can apply for these student uh, travel fund and it, we can help fund your travel. So um, yeah, there's a lot of ways you can get involved. So yeah, I mentioned the trivia, merchandise sales, there was a Rickenbacker 5k walk and run. And then the auction is our biggest uh, way we raise money for MSGSO. So the auction has the potential to bring in over 10,000 for the student travel fund. Uh, and we just had our auction about a week ago. Uh, so this year we raised over 11,000 um, for the student travel fund. And this was the first auction held since 2019 due to COVID. Um, it was held in April at the wet lab. Um, and if we don't have this auction, or large-scale fundraiser, you know, there's limited funds for student travel. So the auction is very important in raising money for our uh, student community. Uh, so the ways to get involved, um, this will be a spring thing next year, but joining the auction committee, you can collect donations from different people and organizations. You can help lead the auction, organize materials, as well as um, volunteering during the event as well. And Ruby was our great lead this semester about the auction. Uh, and then just briefly, our exec board, uh, we have a few different positions and we have some positions open. I know some of these students are graduating. So if you're interested in being involved, um, Max is our president, Will is our secretary, Craig's our treasurer, uh, Burfin is our events chair, Fabrizio is our merch chair, for the sustainability committee, um, I as well as Nicole run it, and then Lisa is the multicultural committee chair. So um, if you are interested in being involved in school, um, we will have some openings in the fall, such as the president, the vice president, merchandise chair, as well as the event co-chair. So, and if there's something that you're like, I want to do or be a part of, um, you can uh, be like, hey, I feel like it'd be awesome if there's this position and you can create your own position uh, and some benefits of joining MSGSO so you can earn STF points uh, towards the student travel fund. And yeah, if you're interested or wanna join, you can reach out to our MSGSO email account. And now I will be talking about the uh, sustainability initiative. Let me just set this up. There we go. So yeah, I briefly mentioned that um, this is a part of MSGSO and we wanna strengthen the intersection of science and sustainability by building environmental awareness and community through initiatives. So I'll briefly talk about each of our initiatives. Um, so our first initiative is our community garden. This is behind SALT. Uh, and so this is kind of what the area looks like prior to setting up the garden. And this is what it looks like now. So it's really cool that um, we've been able to transform the space. We also have some composting uh, by the garden. So if you wanna reduce your waste, your food waste, uh, we accept veggie and fruit scraps as well as paper products and eggshells. Uh, one of our biggest um, initiatives is waste diversion. So how can we reduce waste as our campus? And uh, one of them is textile recycling and clothing swaps. So we have a bin where we collect stained and um, ripped textiles, and that becomes carpeting and insulation. And then we've held three clothing swaps. So students will bring clothing in, and then during one day, you can just pick out a new outfit uh, for free. So we're trying to, yeah, you can get a new outfit for free and you're reducing waste and we donate um, any other items to the women's shelter. Uh, we also do waste diversion um, outside of salt. So, uh, you know, there's lots of cans and plastic bottles that might come through salt. So um, 
how this works on main campus, there's this reverse vending machine. And so every can or plastic bottle you put in earns five cents towards the sustainability initiative. So it's cool. Not only are we reducing waste, we are making money. So we've recycled over 6,000 um, aluminum cans of plastic bottles in I think a little less than a year. And it's raised over $300 for the sustainability initiative. Uh, we also have plastic bag recycling. So some things that wouldn't normally be recycled, uh, like plastic bags, um, Amazon mailers, bubble wrap. Uh, we have a program where we recycle this uh, with trucks and trucks uses these plastic bags and reclaim wood to make composite decking. And we actually earned a bench from recycling over 500 pounds as our community. As you can see uh, the bench in this picture, um, so if you do do a tour on our campus, you can check out the bench at the lower salt patio and we're on our way to second bench. We're actually very close to another bench. So I think we're planning to have that second bench um, by the shuttle. So another place to uh, check out what our initiative has accomplished. Uh, and finally, we've done some electronic recycling. So, you know, as labs use lots of products and especially with new technology, some things will just be thrown out or they're not no longer um, used in the lab. So we also have electronic recycling. And finally, we have cleanup. So we've collaborate, collaborated with other organizations like Debris Free Oceans, and we've done some yoga cleanup. So uh, this is another way to like meet people that are like-minded, uh, but outside of the Rasmus community. And so if you want to get involved or learn more about the sustainability initiative, uh, our website QR codes over here. Uh, and then we also have an Instagram. You can follow us as well as you can reach out to me. My email's here as well as uh, the co-chair, Nicole. And uh, I don't need to go into detail, but we do have a lot of events going up. So we are a very active group and uh, we love getting people involved and helping um, the Rosenstiel community live a more sustainable lifestyle. So thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Remedy. Uh, very interesting stuff. And we have our last presentation of the day. Uh, Anastasia Plotnikova is going to talk about our Students for Students group. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Andrew. I'm going to talk to you about um, Students for Students. Let me share my screen. One second. Okay, so Students for Students um, is an organization um, that is basically um, giving uh, presentations to uh, local students in the Miami-Dade um, school system. Um, so it's a good way to connect kind of our um, graduate students with uh, the broader community. It's also a great opportunity for um, st graduate students to um, to uh, practice their science communication. Um, so and not, all my, not all schools in Miami-Dade um, can bring students to uh, Rosensteel. So we actually are able to bring um, our presenters to their schools. So that allows the, even those students that can't come here to have that opportunity. Um, it's a great way to also spread awareness about regional and local phenomena and issues. Lots of times our presentations have topics that are very relevant um, to um, Miami and the students that are growing up here. So um, it's a great way to kind of spread that awareness. Um, it's also a great way for students, like I said, to um, build their repertoire and build lessons um, and also um, kind of work on um, coming up with presentations that are limited and like high level jargon in order to be more um, um, friendly for those lower levels. Uh, the presentations are often 30 minutes um, or less. 
Um, and you can actually make these presentations with a group. So if you are unavailable to um, make a, to give a presentation on a given day, uh, one of your group members can take over. Um, and also some of the things we do are lab tours. Um, in that case, students from other schools will come onto campus and you'll be able to give a lab tour, maybe like a little demo. And like I said, we cater to a variety of uh, grade levels. So we've given talks to kindergartners, to high schoolers, um, even the general public. And we have reached um, eight different states. So we also do virtual lessons um, via Zoom. This is just a list of some of our current presentations. So we have um, presentations from basically every department on campus. We have presentations from the Marine Biology Department, from the Atmospheric Science Department, Geosciences, um, as you can tell here. And um, when making your presentation as a graduate student, you can kind of indicate what level you are um, you know, okay with presenting to. And um, like I said, we also do presentations for the public. So we have um, right on Key Biscayne next to our campus, the Key Biscayne Community Foundation. So they will often have these uh, lectures open to the public, to that community. And that's a great way for you to um, make connections and build repertoire there. Um, and if you are interested in joining, um, we are always looking for new members. You can contact myself or uh, Victoria. We are the co-coordinators um, co of Students for Students, and we'd be happy to answer any questions um, and also kind of talk to you more about how to build a presentation. We have some resources for that. So it's not like you're just doing it all on your own. Um, yeah, that's all I had to share about Students for Students. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anastasia. Um... If anyone has any questions about student life on campus, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat. I have two quick questions. Um, one of them is just, how easy do you think it is to start a new group if you're a student? Um, does anyone have any thoughts on that? I think it just depends on the amount of time and effort you want to put in. I think if you do want to take on a, a bigger project, I think it is very possible to start a new group or uh, even grow out a whole new branch. Um, like when I came in, like some of the initiatives we didn't have prior and I was very passionate about expanding it. So, um, but my first semester I did put a lot of time into it. So, so I think if you are very interested in something we did not mention, it is definitely possible to add it to our campus. Wonderful. Well, I don't see any further questions at this moment, um, but I did want to take a moment to thank all of you for sharing your expertise on this. And I wanna reiterate that um, we're going to have this available to all of the folks who registered but were not able to attend. And it will also be on our YouTube channel later. Um, so, that will be a great way to, if you need to review things, go back through. Uh, and also, if you have any questions that you want answered, feel free to reach out to me, and I'm happy to put you in touch with anyone who um, you'd like to talk to. And just as a last thing, if you uh, made it with us this far, I just wanted to offer uh, to have you all complete a survey, very brief, brief survey, of how we did on the open house. If you have any thoughts, um, feel free to let us know. And I want to thank you once more for joining us. Uh, and yeah, I absolutely hope we will see you at the Rosensteel School very soon. Thank you so much. We'll leave this up for just a moment before ending the webinar. <laughs>